This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha Friday and welcome to Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii program. This is your host, Beatrice Cantelmo. About four months ago, guest Renuka de Silva graced us with a very beautiful episode titled Elusive Paradise, in which in the engendered description of a marginalization of women and children in Hawaii were examined. Renuka is back with us this afternoon and we will have a chance to discuss another facet of paradise in Hawaii, Sri Lanka and other colonized islands around the globe. Paradise eluded and how Eurocentric views negatively impacted and continues to impact vulnerable populations, especially children and women. Today, Renuka will help us understand how Eurocentric views negatively impacted vulnerable children, especially girls and women, and how post-colonial caste and levels of poverty contributes to paradise eluded in modern times. We will also discuss how current internal structures sustain the social and political divisive structures that continue to impact the same groups and how we can have that changed. On that note, welcome back to our program, my darling. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, and I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for coming back. So, four months already. I feel like it was like four weeks. True. <laughs> what yes. time go? Yes. So, Renuka, do you mind telling our viewers who did not have a chance to hear you last time, mm -hmm about yourself, uh, where are you from, uh, and uh, what do you have to do with your studies, and where you're based, and your connection to Hawaii? Yeah, <laughs> well, love to. So, um, I'm from Canada, I'm Canadian, uh, studying in the United States, but I was born in Sri Lanka, and left when I was very young, and came actually directly to Hawaii, so I grew up in Hawaii for you know, I mean, I went to school here, so I had my um, a few years here before going to Africa. So we've traveled widely. But uh, I'm now back in North Dakota doing my PhD in educational foundations and research. And I'm bringing my research back to Hawaii. Um, so the, the native Hawaiian population, women, and uh, also the indigenous uh, women of Hawaii and their health and well-being. So that is going to be my focus. But at the same time, I'm really interested in how uh, colonization had affected these groups of people way back and continues to do so in many aspects, uh, oh, politically, nice. socially, marginalization. And I am also interested in looking at other spaces like Sri Lanka, rural areas in Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. and how the girls there are being marginalized post-colonialism mm -hmm. and how the structures have transcended now into their social structures and how they are marginalized, re-marginalized again in different ways. So that, that's something that I'm interested in seeing. So last time you were here, mm -hmm. we talked a lot about the engendering aspect of uh, marginalization of right. women in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, so just to recap a little bit, right. uh, let's talk a little bit about that term engendering because a lot of people do not know what that means. Yeah. So when you engender, so it could be, uh, there are many aspects for engendering. So when certain positions, certain um, ideologies are sustained through structures, it engenders uh, certain structures or behavior or uh, um, uh, mindsets. So that's a basic, uh, basic uh, definition of how things tend to engender. But when you have structures in place, so they become social arrangements. So those roles, those roles that women or children or um, institutions play becomes engendered over time. Now, um, when you look at, uh, we last time we talked about women's roles, um, specific roles that have engendered through um, um, Eurocentric worldviews, because when colonizers came here, they weren't interested in 
in the structures that were in place here uh, that meant something to uh, the native Hawaiian population or any other population. They were interested in enculturation or just decimate, uh, decimating, uh, not decimating, uh, uh, just uh, separating, uh, yes, it's, it's just separating it, um, uh, separating and reconfiguring according to what made sense to the colonizer, right? So in that, they assign certain roles to women or children, mostly women, and it was um, it was not on par with the men, and everything was geared towards cash crops or bringing in economy, um, how it would benefit their economies, because remember when the colonizers came, they came in for a purpose, not just to look and say how lovely and let's just leave you alone. It's what can we get from you? How can we change this up to fit our way of looking at things and making money off you? So that meant disrupting a lot of um, structures that were in place that made sense to the local, the indigenous populations that was meaningful. It was a give and take and, uh, and respecting the land and that was all taken out. So when these people also left, they left with a legacy of, um, of uh, disruption. So that displaced a lot of people and, and their cultural uh, cultures and their worldviews. So uh, that's the same thing that happened, for example, in places like Sri Lanka and the rural populations. But... Um, in a different in a different way i'm looking at the rural populations mainly because it affected the whole of sri lanka but i'm looking at most of the rural populations because uh, now these structures have transcended in different ways and still affecting uh, education. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about the other facets of paradise uh, that we're going to be covering today mm -hmm. the eluded one. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? Okay. So <laughs> I've read a little bit. Yes. So when we talk about a paradise, a paradise is beautiful. Uh, our concept of a paradise is everything we want, we have, we're given. Uh, for example, Sri Lanka. I mean, you look at Hawaii, it was a paradise for a different purpose for the colonizer. Um, so Sri Lanka was another paradise. It had several names, resplendent land, uh, the Serendib, uh, from different colonizers who came in, uh, Pearl of the Orient. So, so many names, but it was really their viewpoint on what we can get from these people or this land to benefit us, meaning the colonizer. And um, so when you're looking at the eluded part, I'm looking now from inside out, mm -hmm. not outside in. Mm -hmm. For the people of this land, for the rural people, that concept of paradise, which is... It's farther from the truth of exactly. paradise. Well, as we see yeah. in Hawaii. Yeah, it's the same with, thing, yeah. right? With all of the um, disparities, you know, mm -hmm. that still uh, is perpetuated nowadays socioeconomically, politically, uh, geographically, yeah. uh, education, you know, the, the lack of access, you know, uh, right. and equity. Or marginalized access. Or, or marginalized. So let's talk a little bit about the marginalization right. aspect in access, for example, in education, since mm -hmm. it's your expertise. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of your so, expertise. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so marginalization, you know, when it comes to education, um, or um, if you would call certain schools that offer certain programs, I mean, you know, uh, in the schools in the bigger cities, the richer, um, um, where uh, the richer uh, uh, people live, they have more funding. Like the, I'm talking now the U.S., mm -hmm. right? So when you talk about inner city schools, they don't get the funding uh, that maybe um, a, a wealthier neighborhood might school might get. So you 
you have that disparity there. But in, and so if you look at, if you look at the, the same problem, same challenge in a place like Sri Lanka, uh, you have the rural population versus the urban population. So in the urban population, you do have the schools and the, um, the, the education is free up to, um, uh, up to the elementary level, um, great six I believe uh, so and and education is compulsory for the first nine years uh, it's compulsory uh, so kids do go to school kids have to go there are programs in place but when it comes to the rural areas you don't have as many schools so you have got uh, uh, the demographics of uh, well which school is in which area and how far is it I mean uh, how easy it is to get to the school I mean this is around mo a lot of the developing nations mm -hmm. so it's not unique to Sri Lanka yeah. itself it's just that I am focusing on the rural education going forward I haven't right. really quite started yet I mean I've started I'm it's at the very um, beginning, uh, stage. beginning stages and I'm I, I want to also say at this time a very good uh, colleague of mine from um, uh, another university North Dakota um, State University NDSU her name is Tilani um, Kaushalya and she is partnering up with me to venture out and do this research she's an economist actually oh, and she's finishing her fun. master's so that's really good we yeah. we plan to go to Sri Lanka next um, next June June and July are yeah. you try to also make a connection between what you find uh, in education and vulnerable populations in Sri Lanka to what's happening in Hawaii? Yes, uh, uh, that is actually my ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. Not only Sri Lanka, I'm also looking at other places but one at a time, right? Sure. Um, I did um, studies, uh, I conducted a study like this. My first publication uh, was um, uh, within a village in Uganda. Uh, so we, so I, I'm really looking at different spaces where you don't hear much about you you know you, you got big organizations going into a lot of the developing nations and coming back with reports but they're really not inside in the rural areas where there are huge populations um, uh, girls who who are not who are dropping off I mean even in Sri Lanka we've uh, education is free as I said so they're supposed to be in school and the government is very tough uh, if the kids are not in school but after that at nine years, uh, the girls are facing difficulty, and some of these difficulties are not necessarily because perhaps a school is not there, but because of the structures that are in place, which I'm looking at, such as caste. Mm -hmm. So this is a new concept, um, not the concept of caste, but ca does, a, does caste play a role, for example, in the educational system uh, in, within those rural uh, areas in Sri Lanka, and how so? I mean, it, does that have any correlation to poverty? So there are so many dimensions mm -hmm. to poverty and education and how they interact and inter, um, interface. Mm -hmm. So th this is very interesting, and it's the same thing, I mean, in Hawaii, if you look at uh, uh, education and certain groups, vulnerable groups, as you said, the girls, the women, I mean, it's generational, right? So these are these are coming down. Um, these uh, issues have come down the pipeline. So it's not something you're going to look at it and fix it right away. But we have to really understand the structures that are in place. And for the most part, I think these structures need to be revitalized. Mm -hmm really revisited and see why and why not. So some of the structures that are in place, for example, in spaces in Sri Lanka, uh, didn't really exist during the colonizing period uh, because the colonizer was interested, as in Hawaii, uh, getting the money, the, uh, the economics strike. Uh, so, but now that they're out, they gone, mm -hmm. I'm talking about Sri Lanka in this sure. case, there are other structures that have come up, like the caste system. Mm -hmm. uh, and in some areas, this plays a role in 
the accessibility or, or uh, not only the school, the poverty, there's so many, as I said, there are so many dimensions to this. Mm -hmm. So you can't just say, oh, this, because um, caste is something also that is really not well understood, I think, and that's why there's a need, I feel, um, for research. So we're going to take a quick break, mm -hmm. and when we come back, we're just going to jump right in and talk a little bit more about the definition of caste and how this all is interwoven yes. with poverty yeah. and the whole post-colonial residual um, Eurocentric, you know, influences that uh, mm -hmm. still that seems to impact yeah. the marginalized, mm -hmm. vulnerable individuals. Yeah, uh, great. We have this crazy thing going on today. I was just walking by, and all these DJs and producers are set up all around the city. I just walked by, and I said, "What's happening, guys?" And they told me they were making music. Welcome back to Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hava Ipro. This is your host, Beatrice Cantamo, and I am here back with Renuka de Silva. So, Renuka, we were talking about uh, caste. And I think a lot of people, when they think about caste system, they think about India and all of the divisions, you know, from poor to rich to royalty. But I know that there's more to that. So do you mind uh, giving our viewers the expanded uh, uh, definition and perspective on caste? Okay. So caste, you're right, caste system is based on how you were born into a certain strata of, uh, of the population, right? It's, however, in Sri Lanka, caste system is not quite the same as India, okay? Um, and this so is why me, I asked you that. That's right. Because I'm I glad that you did. It. I'm glad you did. <laughs> so, um, the caste system is based from the days of the kings, okay? So you have got uh, these caste systems. Uh, their names, uh, you can basically tell by, a lot of those names are actually gone now because uh, the, the traditional um, Sinhala names bore the, whatever the job that they did for the king or the, the court. Okay, so you've got the aristocracy, you've got the landowners, and then you've got all these other jobs that people would have done, or their generations would have done, would have performed for the for the for the king's court. Okay, so that that was based on that. So it's a little bit different um, from India, I say, because um, through education, when it comes to education, people have access, right? It's free education. So it doesn't matter which caste you're from, you go to school. Mm -hmm. And you write exams. A lot of the times where you end up in life, educationally speaking, academically speaking, job-wise, it's how you've achieved, how you scored on your uh, on your uh, exams. And exams. Because exams are marked by a exam number as opposed to a name. So they, they would know where you're from, what you do for a living, who you parents are they really don't care I don't you know they don't so where this affects actually um, when I was talking about um, the education and the access and the uh, affecting uh, through education is really in the rural areas it's within the families the um, the poorer families within these groups in rural areas who are still on the mindset of how caste, so we don't do this. For example, um, just looking at the data that's available right now, we see that a lot of the girls are dropping off at um, grade nine, for example. 
Okay? So, and when you look at it, where are they coming from? It's um, the parents' belief systems that's getting the girls off. You know, I mean, it, it could be um, because due to menstruation, for example. So these are things that they believe when it's happening, you shouldn't be in school. Or uh, so Can they're both ideas. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, poverty component to it as well, because you may be taking off of school sooner to start walking. That too. However, look at look at how it is. If you're not in school. Okay, uh, if you're not in school, you don't have the education, so where are you getting the jobs? Mm -hmm. You you can't, right? It will be very uh, blue collar, exactly, or less, or less, or working work in the work fields, work. right? Yes. Or less. So then, if these children, I mean, once they start having kids, they're not educated, and it it's cyclical so so that's that's where the poverty comes in there are so many di dimensions to poverty i mean what there are so many areas that we have to be looking at and right now uh, that is one area now i want to i want to make sure that that everybody understands when i say um poverty has something to do with it or education or girls dropping off there are there's a huge population from rural areas who end up in university as well mm -hmm. okay so it really depends Depends on the family structure. To uh, most cases, uh, I don't think the parents purposefully say, "Oh, girls uh, don't need to be educated." Girls, do. I don't think that mentality is there in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is one of the world's highest, has the highest literacy rate, 97 or 98 percent. That is huge. Mm -hmm. So we value education. They they really do. I mean, they're proud to have their children going to school. But there are pockets, very large pockets, of populations where really the corporations haven't gone in or the government really isn't very active. And there, there are a lot of children, girls, who are not going to school after the compulsory nine-year period. Mm -hmm. Because um, nine years you have to, because the government is very tough. So that is an area. Um, that's 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 where we need to kind of research and see how can we um, improve that situation. Right. right. Now, one of the things as you're talking about how caste influences uh, a person's ability to even. Uh, dream uh, without limits. Uh, when I first moved to Hawaii, I was quite intrigued uh, when I would meet local people. And uh, one of the first three questions that uh, people would ask uh, to another local person would be, where did they graduate from high school? And I, at first, you know, in my innocent view, I was like, oh, how sweet that you can draw back to high school and wanting to make that connection until someone uh, local also explained to me that by uh, you know so much of the relationships and opportunities in Hawaii is about who you know and, and it's so embedded also in the uh, traditions and the class systems that people come from so by asking someone even where they you know, went to school, high school. Yeah, they already they know. seized yes. out to mm -hmm. you know the neighborhood that you lived in, perhaps you know the socioeconomic you know uh, bracket that you belonged or your family belonged, uh, and the, the 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 groups that you associate with and not and that that can impact people's relationships and opportunities even in their twenties, thirties, forties, and fifties. Absolutely, was, that happens all through the United well, States, but right? It's quite shocking yeah. to me. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and that happens more so in these countries where you went to school. Um, when I was a child, I, I went to a, a certain school, and it's a very well known, really great school. Uh, so, people know, I mean, you, you went there, you know, so it, it brings you a certain amount of status, mm -hmm. right? So, it's the same thing. What is fortunate is nobody's stopped from going to school. Family circumstances, poverty, and uh, family's needs, and their belief systems regarding certain social etiquette or social 
belief systems um, causes a hindrance, type of a hindrance uh, for a majority of these, these girls, very particularly the girls. I want to go back to uh, one of the um, intentions of our program also, which was to tie in that part of the Eurocentric influences, not only back in the days, you know, and how it impacted and engendered, you know, uh, women and children, but how that is still impacting uh, vulnerable populations in modern days. Um, I think it's a very important uh, link to make, especially for uh, people who live in islands like us here in Hawaii. There are a lot of times we say it was such a long time ago that many people do not recognize uh, the areas where it's still so, you know, strong and prevalent influence. I, th I think people forget trauma knows no bounds. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think um, when something happens, it's momentary. I said, let's see what we can do to fix it. No, trauma can be generational. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't seem to understand that. So when, when you have a colonizing effect throughout, I mean, over many, many hundreds of years, uh, that trauma passes on. Truly, look, look at the United States. Mm -hmm. You could never call post-colonial. I mean, there are groups that are so marginalized within our borders right. here, right. right, in the U.S. So it's the same in other parts of the world. Mm, yes. So you have you have these these types of trauma that they're carrying and that their children are carrying. Mm -hmm. So you may overcome certain situations, but when they're not addressed at the grassroots levels mm -hmm. uh, coming in from out here and fixing it, that's momentary. Right. Yeah. You, I can't believe it's almost the end of our program, uh, but you were going to come back and we're going to talk yet, you know, yes. about all the efforts of Paradise, because yes. I know that uh, facets, you know, I know that you have you know, much more to share. Uh, but yeah, I, you know, I do feel that um, one of the most destructive uh, byproducts of post-colonialism is the racism and the institutionalized racism that prevents and, uh, certain groups from uh, exiting, you yeah. know, like but in the government. Hegemonies, is, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I hope that uh, your studies in Sri Lanka and the connections that you do here in Hawaii also with your studies can help us uh, improve uh, and, and recognize and unveil uh, more of the institutionalized racism and racism that we see that uh, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders especially, mm -hmm. are faced with, you know, to this day. Uh, in, in, in our community? It's an ongoing task um, without a due date. It's something that we all need to get involved mm -hmm. and ask for change and, and actually give ourselves to that cause and work with it. Absolutely. Well, the first step is recognition. Absolutely. Once Awareness. Rec once there's recognition, taking responsibility. Because exactly. you cannot change without taking ownership of your problems. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, on that note, thank you so much, my darling, for thank being you here. for having me. And, uh, you know, I'll see you pretty soon. Yeah, thank and, you. And uh, that concludes uh, today's episode of Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii program. And uh, join us again next Friday. Friday. And until then, who we hope.